It's Friday, and the Blue Bloods are back with another loaded episode full of college football content for all our listeners out there. We start this episode by analyzing JT Daniels' decision to transfer to the Georgia Bulldogs, and we then debate who are the greatest teams to never win a national title. And then we continue to our hot seat segment, where we analyze which college football coaches in each conference are on the hot seat. And today, we head down south to the SEC. We wrap up the show a little different than normal, but we're going to give you guys our thoughts on Reggie Bush's comments on college football athletes being paid. We have a full show today, guys, so let's kick it off. I'm going to make a quick comment uh, before we get started. So this is our only episode this week. I want to go ahead and apologize for that. Uh, I could blame this on Memorial Day, but I'll go ahead and take responsibility for my own actions, uh, meaning that, you know what? I'll take it back. I don't want to take responsibility for my own actions. I want to I want to declare war on Cox right this second uh, because Wi-Fi in my apartment just does not exist. Cox doesn't like to work on weekends or on Memorial Day. Um, neither do I, so I guess I can't blame them too much. But, yeah, I've been, I mean, ever since then, I've been working until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It's been a whole fiasco. Ask Zach. Ask anybody I've talked to. I just don't have Wi-Fi. As a matter of fact, I'm in Mc, I'm in a McDonald's parking lot. Shout out McDonald's, by the way. This Wi-Fi is immaculate. Uh, I'm in a McDonald's parking lot using the free Wi-Fi. So if I if I sound a little sketch, that's why. But shout out to McDonald's. I still don't eat their food, but it you know it's it's food maybe. Uh, I had I had a diet coke. I went through the drive-through. I felt like I needed to buy something because I'm using their Wi-Fi. So uh, here I am, guys. I'm risking my personal data. It's all for you. Uh, so let's go ahead and get rolling this episode, Zach. Yeah, guys, as I said, you know, just when you thought it was a slow day in college football, we have to change up the entire format of the show because Kirby Smart and the Georgia Bulldogs make one of the biggest splashes in the country so far. And JT Daniels announced Thursday afternoon that he will be taking his talents to Athens, Georgia, to join the Georgia Bulldogs. You know, we we, we covered this. Yeah, it's definitely insane. And we covered his transfer in a probably a few episodes back and just to reiterate he was a five-star prospect and was the number two quarterback in the country behind only Trevor Lawrence and he committed to USC but injuries gave way to Keaton Slovis he's kind of held on to the job since then so Daniels decided to transfer Georgia just landed Wake Forest transfer Jamie Newman this offseason, but now Daniels brings in some much needed depth in the QB room. So, Brandon, what do you make of this news and what does Daniels bring to Athens and the Georgia Bulldogs? I don't really know what he brings to to Athens or the or Georgia because I thought they I thought they were set with their quarterback, right? I mean, what's going on with Jamie Newman? I mean, there's a new kid in town now. Uh, a lot of people would say, you know, that's I mean, that's JT Daniels. I mean, the only reason he lost his job at USC is because Keaton Slovis came in and had, I mean, he finished off the year in fantastic fashion. Uh, everyone knows how high I am on on Keaton Slovis. I mean, why wouldn't you be? He's probably, if he's not the best sophomore quarterback, he's the second best. We all know who Zach thinks is the best. Um, uh, anyway, I, I just don't really understand the move here. I don't know why you go to Georgia. Maybe he's like willing I mean I'm sure he wants to play for this for this spot for the starting position at Georgia but uh, I mean they're going with they're going I mean they already have their quarterback right I mean I guess he could battle it out or whatever but um I don't know I, I feel like it's a risky move for him um I understand you know he has what three more years of eligibility yeah so, three more years yeah so three more years of eligibility so I guess I mean uh, after this year, I mean, he's got two. So, I mean, I guess he's got two more years with Georgia after this, for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I don't understand the move myself. I feel like if I were in his shoes, I'd go somewhere where I'd probably be the starter immediately. Unless, I mean, maybe he wants to rehab for a year or something. Or I, I don't I, have, I don't know what's going through his head. But he's going to Georgia, and I've never hated him more than I do right now. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't think many people saw this decision coming, but researching it for me, it it starts to clear up and make sense to me. So first, I think that, well, let me say this. I think there's about three factors that led Daniels to 
to this decision. And the first being that Todd Munkin, the new offensive coordinator, runs the perfect offense for Daniels. And he doesn't have to do it all by himself, like at USC, where you had to stand back and throw it because they had no run game. And George is going to have a running back. They're going to run the ball, and it's going to open up Daniels to make deep throws downfield off the play action. And Munkin has coached in the NFL, which is a huge thing for college quarterbacks these days because it preps them to make it the next step to the league. And secondly, I would say Georgia always seems to have an elite offensive line and elite weapons for their quarterbacks. I mean, Jake Fromm probably has some of the best weapons during his time in, in Athens. And this is this has to mean a lot to JT Daniels because throughout his career at USC, outside of Michael Pittman, USC didn't have any weapons. I mean, their running game was one of the worst in the Pac 12s last the Pac 12 last year, and their passing game wasn't great. Kedis Lewis made a lot of stuff happen, but Kedis Lewis also had a lot of receivers drop passes. I don't think George Pickens is dropping a lot of passes in, in Athens. And USC had no run game. Like I said, I I, I dare other than US people who love USC football to name me a running back off of USC's roster. I don't um, think I don't think you could do it. No, I, mean, I can't. Um, <laughs> and, and, you ha- and you have a whole college football podcast that we've covered USC on. But an average fan definitely cannot tell me a single running back off of that roster. And No, there's no chance. Yeah, and lastly, Brandy, you kind of brought this up. But I want to kind of clear it up for you. Maybe it'll make a little bit more sense for you. But the odds of JT Daniels getting a waiver to start immediately at Georgia is very low. So the so odds are he does have to sit out a year before he can play, which allows Newman to get in his one year, get to the NFL, and then Daniels can step in. Um, Daniels has will have the reins, I think, for two, three years after Newman leaves. And Newman's already getting first-round grades by a lot of NFL, I guess, uh, analysts, NFL draft ex- experts. And if th- unless things go extremely south, I think he's a lot to go for first, second round this next year. So I think this makes complete, complete sense to me because Daniels, Needs to rehab for sure. And he was a little rough his fresh his freshman year through a lot of interceptions compared to touchdowns. And a year to sit back and develop and get some chemistry with your teammates is priceless. And I think this is actually a really, really good choice for JT Daniels. And for me, I think it gives UGA a solid backup option. New but besides Newman, there's really not anyone behind him that really puts the fear into any SEC defenses. So if your plan is to redshirt Daniels or if he gets a waiver or whatever, I think it, it gives UGA, if Newman goes down, they have that option of Daniels. I, but, Brad, I got to ask this. If Daniels gets a waiver, who do you start? Man, I don't. I mean, I, I think that you kind of built the hype. Uh, I don't know. That's that's such a that's such a tough question because, like I said, I mean, like we've been talking about, JT Daniels is such a talented guy. I mean, but Jamie Newman, I mean, there's all this hype around his name right now. That's all people. That's all Georgia fans want to talk about is Jamie Newman. I mean, they are sold on this kid. Um, I don't know, man. I, I think he'd battle it out. I'd lean more toward Jamie Newman. I think that. Uh, I think if you don't start him at this point, then then Athens might burn to the ground. Like people might revolt. Yeah, I agree with you. I think they would have to start Newman because of the fans. But personally, I think Daniels is the better quarterback. I think he's more talented. I think he fits the system better. But I don't think Newman's going to be happy, man. If Daniels gets the job, Jamie Newman is going to have a serious problem, and I think that could be real. That that could turn negative real quick for Georgia and recruiting because. If he's going to tell recruits, hey, these guys lied to me, to my face, when they recruit me to transfer in. And I I just, I think, and it's weird, it's a weird situation because, Brandy, you don't see a lot of quarterbacks transfer to schools and not start. No, that's true. I mean, people, I mean, well, (laughs) depends. Um, But no, you don't see a name like Jamie New, and especially with the hype that's been built up around his name at this point. I mean, they've really done everything they can to sell Jamie Newman. and I think they've done an excellent job of it. I mean, at, at this point, I'm convinced. You know, I think Jamie Newman's going to be—he's going to be a good player in this, this upcoming season. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's 
I don't know. That, that's just who I'm leaning toward. Um, I don't see a way that JT Daniels steps in and goes, you know what? I'm the quarterback now. It's gonna be like that. It's gonna be like that scene where that's the Smalley pirate. That's like, look at me. I I'm the quarterback now. If he does, but he won't. <laughs> he definitely won't. But personally, I would give this. I would give the the transfer an A plus for me. I know. I'm not supposed to like Georgia as an Auburn fan, but this is a great. This it makes. Uh, I know Georgia's already technically a national championship contender. I think this makes them a favorite in the next two three seasons. Really? I think JT Daniels. JT Daniels for me is the most talented quarterback Georgia's had under Kirby Smart. Okay, that's that's a take. Uh, would you not say JT Daniels is more talented than Jake Fromm? I don't know. I, I think I'd have to think about it. I mean, you kind of put me in a spot a little bit. Uh, he's me, he's give he's me, give more me thirty seconds to think. All right, for thirty seconds, guys, I'm going to say this: He's the most talented quarterback Georgia's had, even under Mark Rick. I would go okay, back I mean, that far. Ah, oh, man, that's tough. You, I'm going to need a little bit more time, but I mean, we can talk about this another day. I, honestly. I think he has more potential. I think that he definitely has the potential to be more talented and show more. I think if we're comparing him to this past year's Jake Fromm, then absolutely. I mean, 100%. But I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not fair, though. That, that saying, Jake man. Fromm that's, was horrible. It's bananas. And, it's bananas. You can't do that. And what about this quarterback room, man? They already have a they have a Brock Vandergriff already committed, who's the number two quarterback five-star this year. Right. Right. committed so that qb room is going to be stacked and i would say it already gives them a lineup to have one of the better quarterback rooms in the country yeah you can only start one quarterback though just remember that uh, t- tell that to gus malzahn tell yeah, that to dude. gus malzahn because he started four against clemson in 2016 <laughs> <laughs> well how, how did that turn out uh, not well. I mean, they 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 only lost by seven, but like it still didn't turn out well. They they put a fullback at quarterback, Brandon, a fullback. That's bad. That's really bad. I was in the stands and almost left. I can't do it. But <laughs> guys, we're moving on to our second topic of the day, and every everybody remembers the team that walks away with the national championship, the honor, the trophy, whatever. But what about the teams that were one or two plays away or an injury away from taking that title? There have been countless teams that may have been more talented or even deserved the championship more than the actual champion. But through a stroke of bad luck or an upset loss, they missed that chance or they gave that chance away in the national championship game. We each picked two of the best teams that did not win the national championship. We kept these in the modern era, guys. It's really hard to compare these 1950, 40 teams to current teams today. So the cutoff was 1980. So, Brandon, tell me your first team that you picked as the best team never to win a national championship. 2011 LSU. Was that even a question? Who I thought is the best team to never win a championship? I mean, good God, they had to play Alabama again. There's no reason they should have they should have had to play Alabama twice that season. Al, Nick Saban was quoted as saying, "If you can't win your conference, you shouldn't be in the national championship." Well, Alabama got in the national championship and they beat LSU twenty-one nothing in New Orleans. Uh, was the team in the game? Not necessarily. They didn't want to be there. They didn't want to have to beat Alabama again after they already beat them that season. Uh, I mean, think about all the talent on this team, Zach. Uh, it, it's this team was loaded. There really wasn't. I mean. That season was like impeccable. Other than that Alabama game, I mean, they, they beat Alabama six to nine um, during the regular season, and that was, I mean, by far one of the best games in college football history. By the way, it was very boring, a lot of defense, but very good game. Um, I just don't, I don't know. There, there's that game gets to me. That was more of a personal pick. I, I, I know you probably don't agree with me here, and you probably wasn't even close, but. I mean, there. I mean, I don't know. The, the, okay, I, I, listen, I'm, listen, I'm listen, L- listen. That that is a good pick. I th- I think if I made a list of ten to fifteen, they'd be on it. it, it, it will you take that? No, I don't care. I don't care where you put okay, it on there. Okay, I, I okay, okay. I'm not going to argue with you. You know, All if right, I wasn't so, an LSU fan, would this be on my list? <laughs> probably, probably not. not. <laughs> that but, team did have a lot of talent, though, but they did get shut me. out. 
They, they didn't pass the 50 after, yard line. They got shut out after their players were on Bourbon Street the night before because they didn't want to be there. Uh, how would you not want to be in the national championship? Because you already beat the team you're playing. That doesn't like, you're the, no. You're that is twice. the worst. That was the worst excuse I've ever heard in my life. They didn't want to be there. They weren't motivated for the national championship. They were, they were at Harris, Zach. They were at Harris the night before. That that's horrible. Oh my gosh. And that's what I would have been doing if I were. Well, I take it back. Probably not. Sorry, yeah. family. Whoever's listening. <laughs> <laughs> Wedding canceled. Um, okay, so Brandon, do you think? Picking the only team since 1980 that went undefeated, that wasn't on probation, that wasn't not bowl eligible. Do you think picking like one of the only undefeated teams is a fair pick here? Uh, no, I don't because I know who won the national championship that season. Um, yeah, it's the 2004 Auburn Tigers is the obvious pick here. It's not obvious. Um, That's stupid. This is another – I mean, it's not stupid. It's the same as my pick, but yeah, whatever. No, my team went undefeated, Brandon. Whatever, okay, listen, dude. I mean, it's Listen, lame. listen. I, I, I got Why? stats to back this up. Are you ready? My favorite team went undefeated too and, and, until, the, until the national championship. Yeah, but they lost. That, that They lost the chance to – like this team didn't even get a shot. They even won their bowl game. That They went 13-0. and 0. Sucks. And – and they ended the season with five top 15 victories, most in the country. The two teams that played for the national championship didn't even have five combined. <laughs> Who are we talking about? And, that? Uh, USC and Oklahoma. USC beat them like 52 to like 17. It was a blowout. Who and the team? Uh, Reggie Bush. Yeah. And yeah, but technically, if you want to be – technical with it in the in the NCAA record books there is not a national championship for 2004 because USC <laughs> had it stripped so you're trying to tell me <laughs> so you're trying to tell me that you honestly think that if Auburn if it would have been Auburn USC in that national championship game that Auburn would have won a thousand percent and I got stats no, you ready so I don't need stats Braden they, have, they, they had Reggie they Bush had, they had the number one defense in the country Brandon they allowed five rushing touchdowns in the entire season and three of them came in the SEC championship. They allowed two rushing touchdowns all regular season. They only allowed 25% of their opponents third down to be converted and they had the they had the best running back combo in the country in Carnell Williams and Ronnie Brown who went 2 and 5 in the NFL draft. And the defense was the best in the country, Brandon. It was number 1 ranked in points per game and they only had three games within eight points, Brandon. One of them was a Sugar Bowl win over a top 10 Virginia Tech team. One of them was the defending national champion LSU team. And the third one was an eight-point win in the Iron Bowl at Bryant-Denny. I would say those are relatively good wins. Yeah, I'm sure. And they had three top 10 picks on that team. Plus a quarterback who went later in the first round. They also had Carlos Rogers, Will Herring, Kevin Sears, Travis Williams, Stanley McClover. Th- that team was loaded. Those and are they, all they household were, names. Jack. They, they, every single one of them went on to play in the NFL. But we can we can keep going there. Um, and to to add on to that, th- they were had the 18th best offense in the country. So they had a top 20 offense and defense. And you're telling me they wouldn't have competed with USC? That's outrageous. I didn't, I didn't say they wouldn't have competed. I, all I said was that USC had Reggie Bush, and I think he probably would have beat Auburn by himself. Okay, I think you could have no, 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 no. I think it could have been Reggie Bush alone on the field against Auburn, and he still would have won. What happened against Texas? I, are we going to talk about? We don't need to talk about that yet, Zach. Don't spoil it. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. Okay, we'll do the snake draft style. I'll give you my second pick. So oh, apparently, a, apparently, me and Brandon both took this so, question really so personal. Chose, so you chose you chose snake draft after this is ridiculous. I, I'm, this this is in protest now. This this list is in protest. Oh, man. So me and Brandon went real personal there. We have some vendettas against this question, apparently. Yeah, we um, had some, we had some uh, 
We had, we had some, some opinions. Yeah. <laughs> some opinions. And literally, I could, well, I've got a feeling we both could talk about those teams for an entire hour, but we know you don't want to hear an entire hour long podcast about the 2011 LSU team and the 04 yeah, Auburn do. team. Sure. Um, but my second pick is probably also going to be controversial. Um, but I'm going to go with the 1986 Miami Hurricanes. That's not controversial. What are you talking about? It's, it, it's a little bit. I mean, th- there's. Really. More, I, th- I feel like there's more obvious picks in this one. Well, yeah, but, but I mean, that's like a really good pick. Like that's. If yeah, it's not I, I your would, number one. It has to be your top three for sure. I, it's def- This is my number one. The Auburn one would be like two, but this is number one, and. This is just this is a team that probably was the best team in the country and had one bad game that spoiled their entire season. Brandon, they outscored their opponents this season four hundred and thirty to one fifty. That's pretty good. They they averaged the they had the third best offense in the country and the fourth best defense in the country. And people, you know, you had the argument against the 01 Miami team that they didn't play anybody. This Miami team played a top 15 Florida team, the number one team in the country in, in Oklahoma. They played a top 20 Florida State team, and they played number two Penn State. The, yeah. the schedule was there. And, Brandon, would not, like you called Auburn's team a list of no-name players. This Miami I didn't say roster- no-name. I just said if you were to go ask football fans right now, if, they, like, if you asked them yes or no, they wouldn't say yes to half your list, and they knew them. Whatever, man. But this roster, for me, the 86 Miami team, is probably one of the most talented in history. You had the Hosman winner and Vinny Testaverde at quarterback. The running back, Alonzo Hosmith, was one of the best running backs in, in the country. Michael Irving and Brett Perryman, both in the NFL, were your wide receivers. You had Randy Shannon on defense, Benny Blades on defense, Jerome Brown on defense. All these players went on to the NFL and had success after Miami. And they dominated, they beat the number one Oklahoma team by 28 to 16, a double digit win over them. They lost to Penn state in the natty, Brandon. I want to throw out some stats to you. Okay. Okay. Um, this, this is just outrageous. They lost to Penn state in a close game. They had seven turnovers, Brandon, in that game. Seven. Okay. And do you want to, do, do you want to hear the yardage difference between them and Penn state? Yeah. Sure. Miami had 445 yards of offense to Penn State's 162, and they still lost. Jeez. If you tell me that Miami wasn't the better team and just didn't have a bad game, you're lying. That is just a fact. You are lying through your teeth that Miami didn't deserve that win. They had one bad game. And th- Brandon, they still only lost fourteen to ten with seven turnovers. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's very good. I won't, I won't lie; it's pretty L- good. Literally, if they just had six turnovers, they probably win that game. But it was that <laughs> seventh one that the just seventh one. buried them. Really, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, it was, God, it was, it was that, tough. It was that bad. I mean, do you, can you imagine being a Miami fan and just like watching these just repeated turnovers just happen? You're like, is that seven? Is that really seven turnovers? What is this a joke? What no, it's it, kind it, of joke. What, what, what was it? The 2019 Cheese It Bowl that the teams had like a combined like <laughs> ten turnovers in like the first half. There were more turnovers than points. That's tough, but yeah, I'm going with the '86 Miami team. I think it was, I think it was the most talented. And just the best team in the country that season, and they should have been the national champions that year. Yeah, um, with my last pick, uh, can, am I allowed to go with 2004 USC because they don't have a national championship? No, you cannot go with 2004 USC. I'll go with 2005 USC. Uh, I'll go with the team that lost to Texas. You already alluded to it. Um, what an incredible game, right? I mean, best game in college football history. Some people say, Pro- um, probably. Yeah. So. I don't know, man. It's if if it's not, it's definitely it's my personal favorite. It's my it's the best game in my opinion. But yeah, I mean that team, like I said, it was basically a 2004 team except for they lost to Vince Young. So I mean that's I'll take it. You know, I don't have a lot of stats to back this up, but yeah, that's 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 the way I'm going with. Uh, I mean, I'll give it to you. I mean, I think they're they're one of the best. I don't think they're the best, but. 
I can see. I mean, they had Lindell White, Reggie White, Matt uh, Matt Leonard. I, I get it. And really and truly, if it wasn't for some ill time turnovers and things like that, I think they win that game. Vince Young had to, people forget how like I watched that game when they aired it. What was it a few weeks back during quarantine? I, I watched that game back, and you you forget how strong USC looked through the second third quarter. Texas had to make a strong strong comeback, and Vince Young didn't al- almost didn't have a chance to save Texas in that game. No, I know, uh, and uh, man, I can go on for hours about this game, but don't don't get me started on it. If we were if, if if we were a video podcast, we definitely have highlights of this game. But I think if I remember right, guys, you can find this game on YouTube. Look up the 2005 Rose Bowl, 2005 USC versus Texas. Watch this game because it is. Uh, I was uh, like Brandon said. Uh, for me, it's probably the one or two best game of all time. It's right up there with Miami Ohio State in the Fiesta Bowl. It right up there with the Kick Six. All that it is one of the greatest games of all time by far. But yeah, let us know who you think is the, I guess, the best team to never win a national championship. I'm assuming nobody's picking 04 Auburn or 2011 LSU. But if is it 86 Miami? Is it 05 USC? Let us know. But we're going to move on to our third segment of the day, guys. It's Hot Seat Watch. And um, in case you missed the last few episodes, this is where we break down which head coaches are on the hot seat going into the college football season. We've covered all pretty much all the conferences. We have two left, but today we take it down south to the SEC. Yikes. Brandon, I, I'm assuming Coach O's not on the hot, hot seat, so which head coaches do you feel are on the hot seat right now? Uh, I mean, it's not that hard of a question. You know, it's funny because a lot of these uh, a, a lot of these rankings have been pretty tough. I mean, I think the only one that's been easy for us has been the Pac-12, right? Yeah, and this was just as – I think this one's really hard too because, I mean, you have Lane Kiffin, Mike Lee, Sam Pittman, Eli Drinkowicz are all new, and no matter what happens, even an 0-12 season, Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, Dan Mullen, and Coach O are staying. And really right. and truly, I don't, I don't see – I mean, maybe, but I think Jimbo Fisher might even be in that list. Yeah, uh, he – I don't know. Because he hasn't, I mean, he hasn't had like a spectacular season since he's been there, but he is Jimbo Fish. I get what you're saying. Um, I think, I mean, obviously, there, there's Derek Mason, who, how would he not be on your list, right? You know, yeah, he's, on, he's on my list. Yeah, yeah he's on my sure. list, too. I, he, he was my second pick because I felt like it was almost too obvious to go with him. You don't want to pick on him too much, yeah. But, I mean, we can break it down. I mean, this isn't a surprise here, guys. I think any Vandy coach outside of James Franklin when he was there has been on the hot seat. But I think his time's coming to an end extremely fast. He's 27-47 and 47 at Vandy and had a 3-9 and nine season last year. And, Brandon, he lost to Purdue when everyone was hurt and UNLV. No, it's not good. Like, we get it. It's, it's pretty bad. Um I don't know, but at the same time, it's Vanderbilt, and they, you know, they will fire their coaches. But how good's it really going to get? It's never going to be James Franklin again, you know. Like, so what? Well, are they, no, what are I mean, they, they could, they could strike gold. I mean, no, no one thought James Franklin was James Franklin. I mean, they're going to have to get a younger coach, a younger coach with a bright future. I mean, but the and like I, I've continued this trend. The schedule to t- dictates this segment for me, Brandon. They have at Missouri. At Kansas State, at Georgia, at Kentucky, South Carolina, Florida, at Texas A&M, and Tennessee. Okay. That's eight losses, right? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't think – I think there there might be one or two on there that aren't, like, automatic losses. Well, no. I, I think Kentucky and Missouri probably aren't automatic, but Missouri's reloading, and Kentucky just got Joey Gatewood in at quarterback in return most of their roster. I don't think so, South Carolina is necessarily an automatic loss. I don't know, man. I, I think South Carolina is in trouble, but I don't think they're Vandy in trouble, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's a perfect segue, really. Uh, my second coach, this is going to be the last one, I think, for me. I have Will Muschamp on my, on my hot seat, like, bad. Um, I don't know. I, I think he's done for. I, I, I think... <laughs> 
I really do. I don't see a way that he keeps his job after this season. Uh, unless he uh, has, unless he makes a bowl game, or unless he like, if he makes a bowl game, he's safe. But I don't, I don't, I just don't know that South Carolina can make a bowl game this year. I don't know, man. Okay, so he's also my pick. <laughs> I think this is the first segment where we've picked the same two people. Um, yeah, I, I, he's he's had a rough man. I mean, four and eight last year is unacceptable. I mean, the, the leash is shrinking right here, man. I mean, he lost to North Carolina, Missouri, Tennessee, and Appalachian State. Those are four pretty bad losses. Yeah. Well, North Carolina is not that bad. Uh, you know, if I mean, it was, it was at week one, though. No one knew. You lost to a true freshman starting his first game. They did beat Georgia, though. Yeah, yeah, th- but that was Jake Fromm's um, coming out party on. He's trashed. <laughs> that was that was mean. You didn't have to phrase it like that. That that was just a bad game, and you could tell immediately that South Carolina was not the better team there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah. and, and the season starts manageable. They're going to win a lot of games early, but Brandon, the the back end of their schedule is at Florida, Tennessee. Texas A&M, Georgia, at LSU, and then at Clemson. That's really bad. It's, it's not going to be I, good. I, I think that's six games that they lose for sure. Guaranteed. Automatically? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, think Tennessee is going to be much improved. I think so. Um, and I don't want to like jump to this because he's not really on my hot seat after this recruiting cycle. But Jeremy Pruitt, he, you're very close to being on my hot seat. You're not seeing oh, that. If Jeremy Pruitt comes out and wins less than eight games, he's directly on the hot seat. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you can't go through recruiting like the way you've been doing and then just lay an egg. You have to do something with it. Yeah, I mean, I for know. sure. And 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 then like they also still have to travel to Kentucky, which recently has been a tough place to play. And if he loses seven games, I think that that's probably the end of the must champ era in South Carolina. And especially the thing about these coaches, man, the thing that dictates the hot seat for some of these coaches is how is your biggest rival doing? You look at Clemson, I think they're doing pretty good. Oh, yeah, they're okay. <laughs> yeah. And then your biggest division rivals are, are all on the upswing. You got Georgia has been to a national championship. You have Florida who has been to, multiple New Year's Six games in the past few years. And then you have Tennessee, who is probably one of the hottest teams on the recruiting trail and one of the dark horses for the next season. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I don't know, man. And and we're so quick to forget how good South Carolina was just a few seasons ago. Yeah, you know I mean, they were they were like a legitimate like championship contender. And now look at what they're doing. It's, it's, I I don't know I don't know where I think recruiting man like when Steve Spurrier was there and they were competing for SEC titles, uh, Steve Spurrier was recruiting well and Will Muschamp has not kept that same level of recruiting up, which is crazy. I mean, because Will Muschamp, well, at least I thought he was a good coach. Maybe he was just in a good spot at Florida. Well, I, I think if it's hard to go to Florida and not be good. Let's be let's be completely honest here. You're in a pipeline state for elite talent. You're the really and truly since Miami's fell off, you are the the program in that state, and uh, you play in the best conference that anyone in that state plays in. I think Florida is in a real good spot, and you saw if a coach goes there and doesn't succeed, it kind of almost ends their career. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's I don't know it. it... We're getting on to like a whole different topic right now, but yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> and I, I want to circle back to Derek Mason real quick. We, um, you know, I, I listed those eight games. Brandon didn't see eight guaranteed losses. I did. And Brandon, the two games I left off the, their schedule, one was Ole Miss. I, I don't mean, know what th- that, that, that might not be a total scrub this year. Yeah, so they easily could lose that game. And then, Brandon, their non-conference game, Louisiana Tech. And we just saw Louisiana Tech smack Miami. Yeah, they did. And I'd I'd be willing to say that South Carolina this year is – it might be comparable to Miami of last year. They're just a disappointment. No, 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 no. no, no. We circle back to Vandy now, man. We were oh, done Vandy. with South sorry, Carolina. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm in shambles. I'm in McDonald's. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, nah, man. Randy, I mean, they're getting they're getting smacked. <laughs> smacked by Louisiana Tech. But I mean, and so for me, I just think Vandy needs a fresh start. I don't think it says anything about Derek Mason. Vandy's a tough job to win at. And but when the fans have checked out, the players look checked out. That can lead to major long-lasting problems for the longevity of your program, and I think Vandy needs a. I think Vandy needs to clean it up. Yeah, I mean they have to, and if they, I mean, it's Vandy. I don't want to say it can make or break you because usually it just breaks you. But James Franklin, I mean, it made him. So I don't know. I feel like if you can succeed at Vanderbilt, you're going to succeed anyway. Yeah, but that's why. That's, that's why it made him. <laughs> Not now, anyway. So I, don't I mean, D- James Franklin dominated when he was at Vandy, guys. I mean, he was beating SEC. I mean, he was competing. He had Vandy ranked, guys. When's the last time we saw Vandy ranked? But I just want to make one honorable mention. Brandon made his honorable mention of Jeremy Pruitt. Um, yeah, Gus Malzahn, you got to get it together, or you also could be out. Uh, you know, he went nine and three with a true freshman quarterback. I think that bought him a year of goodwill. And anytime you beat Alabama, even with a backup, you get that benefit of the doubt. Plus, losing to LSU and Death Valley by three with a true freshman quarterback, that's nothing to be upset about, especially how LSU played last year. And I, I think his make or break game, Brandon, I know you're going to hate this. Week two, North Carolina, if he loses that game, that's they're going to set that seat on absolute fire. Yeah, I mean, no doubt. It's a good point. Because I mean, they still have to travel to Alabama and Georgia this year. They get LSU at home, but it's the week before that the week before the Iron Bowl this year. If Gus Malzahn turns out another eight and four, seven and five year, I think he's gone, man. I think the fans are gonna have enough. I think uh, I real, I really, really think that if Gus Malzahn fails to utilize all the talent he has on that field, then, I mean, they're going to run him straight out of town. I mean, this is every single season with Auburn, though. I, I mean, he's always on the hot seat, and then he beats Alabama, and then he's off. It's ridiculous. I guess yeah, they can't beat Alabama two years in a row, so probably not this year, but. I don't I'll say I, that they they have they haven't beat Alabama and Bryant and Denny since 2010 with Cam Newton. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not going to happen. I don't know. It's it, this makes ten years, so who knows? I mean, numbers are everything. So maybe. Yeah, but but how long has it been since they beat LSU? Well, it's all about balance. Oh, good point. Good point. You make a very have, valid and, point. And they have not won at Georgia since 2005. They need to get over some of this. This is starting to get a little bit ridiculous for Auburn. Okay, listen, uh, as an Auburn fan, and even as an LSU fan, you probably know this, Auburn is a team where if you have them at home, you are worried. You're like, oh, boy, that Auburn team could show up and beat anybody. I mean, but if they're playing on the road, you just yawn and move on. That's probably why Joe Burrow didn't, put, didn't really worry about Auburn coming in. They were like, oh, we won by three. I cannot believe we almost let them beat us. <laughs> That's a fair point. I mean, it's been a while since they've won on the road. I mean, they beat everyone else on the road, but LSU, Georgia, and Bama, they're, they're, there's like a there's a disconnect, I would say, on what's going on there. But, guys, we're going to move on. Last segment of the day. And it, it we usually do recruiting update here, but with the change in schedule and JT Daniels committing, we kind of changed up our thing. We'll be back with recruiting update next episode. But... Reggie Bush has made the transition from player to analyst, and I think he offered one of his more controversial takes recently. In an interview with Playboy, Bush stated that paying athletes will destroy some people if their foundation is not in the right place. He continued by stating that he did hire good agents and a good team of financial support, but allowed them to make all of his decisions, which limited his success. These comments have some people upset while others support what Bush has said. And so we're going to kind of break this down here. So Brandon, what do you make of these comments and what would a solution be to prevent any harm coming to players? I don't. So first of all, I want to point out a few things. Number one, didn't realize this interview was with Playboy. That's hilarious. That's the first thing. Uh, The second thing, pretty funny as well that he's talking about how, uh, paying players might be a bad thing. That's pretty funny. Um, And and I want to go ahead and preface this like I do with a lot of segments. 
I support college athletes being paid. I think it's the right thing to do. I think that you're, if a school is making that much money off of you playing football, you should be able to, you know, make a little bit of that bat on the back end. Um, no, but I mean, I, I get what he's saying, and I I want to agree with him. It's just I don't I don't know if I can fully. I think that's the case with anybody. I mean, I think money can break anybody, right? Uh, I mean, somebody somebody gets money that doesn't know how to use that money, doesn't know what they're doing. I mean, they might abuse it. They might. I, I mean, how many how many professional athletes do we see after their career that are broke because they don't know how to manage their money? It's just. It, yeah, it can break you for sure. I mean, it, the game becomes all about the money to you, to some people. Um, I can see how it would be a bad thing, but I, I can't say that I agree with them 100% on this. Yeah, I'm going to take the complete opposite stance here. I 1,000% agree with what Bush said here and his what his sentiments are. I think it's the same argument that, I mean, Brandon, you can vouch for me here. I, I've made this same argument on this podcast right. about college athletes being compensated. And, okay, so... Let me say this. Uh, I, my take is kind of in the middle about whether college players should be paid and what that looks like. But if we are going to play these, pay these players thousands to millions of dollars, we do need to have financial liter- literacy courses or just a group of courses to for these players to take. Why are we making these players take History 101? Wouldn't Finance 101 or Money Management 101 be a much more efficient and useful yeah. class for these athletes? Yeah, but I mean, that means that you have to hold these athletes to a different standard than a regular student, too. I mean, okay. every, uh, single no, student, I, every single student that goes into college has to take History 101. Yeah, well, I, mean, I personally think every student should have to take a class like Finance 101 or no, I think Money Management. Be, I don't think you should have to. I think it should be offered, but yeah. Um, I mean, I see what you're saying. I definitely and, and, get that. But and you say like I'm holding them to a different standard. They are held to a different standard, right? But you can't it, give them a different course load. You can give them a different degree. I mean, you have to change all sorts of things. They already have a different course load. What do you what? Yeah, like it, it has been shown. I mean, Arian Foster came out and said that Tennessee made him take a certain course load because of practice and the schedule and everything like that. Like they they have to tweak the athlete's schedule and the, what they can do and take to fit into being a full time student athlete. Yeah, that, that yeah. is that is that is that's been shown multiple times and. I mean, so the reason I say this because, Brandon, I mean, J- Reggie Bush was a Heisman winner, one of the most popular players in the country. But even players who don't make it to the NFL can still profit off their name after this. I mean, as an LSU fan, you probably get excited to see players that I probably would not even recognize because of where they played. And so these guys, even the ones that aren't successful, need to have this. And uh, like you said, we've seen so many athletes, not just football players, who were grown adults and thought they surrounded with, themselves with good people lose everything. I mean, t- just some examples. Terrell Owens reportedly made almost $100 million on the field and filed bankruptcy in 2012, which is right after he um, retired. Mike Tyson lost over $40 million and had to file yeah, bankruptcy. There's, there's a reason he's in movies. He's trying to yeah, make exactly. Money. And then same with Allen Iverson, as sad as that is, that was my favorite basketball player. I mean, Allen Iverson also did the same thing. And all these examples serve serve a purpose. And I think, I mean, yeah, History 101, that was kind of a joke. But I, I do think we need to have more classes or have, like I said on the podcast when, I, when we had Nick on, uh, we need to have some sort of counsel or something, some sort of proper guidance for these athletes before we just hand them over millions of dollars i think it should be made available but i mean i don't i don't think it's mandatory i don't let me say this too i don't agree with like you said um, about tennessee making their players take certain courses at certain times because of practice and everything. i don't agree with that at all you know i don't think you should force anybody to take anything they don't want it's college I mean, you're you're in college there there's a certain amount of freedom that comes with that well right he wanted he wanted to do a, like physics or something He's like a very that. Smart but guy, by the way, like yeah. Super um, smart. So if you guys want to fact check me, go listen to Arian Foster's interview on the Joe Rogan podcast. It was a hell of an interview. Oh, that's but what you're I, referring to Joe Rogan. We're playing Joe Rogan now. 
Yeah, we're plugging Joe Rogan, even though he just got a hundred mil for his podcast yeah, to be exclusive yeah. on Spotify. I don't, I don't think he needs us to plug him, Zach. <laughs> but no, it's a dope interview. But he said he was trying to major, I believe, in like physics or something like that. But some of the classes conflicted with their football schedule, and so they told him he could not major in that. Yeah, no, and like I, for I've heard that forbid, like too. yeah, forbid him to do all kind of stuff, and and like at Auburn, I know there was this thing where like there's like this certain like communication class that they just reformat every semester, and the players can take it up to like four times, and it's like the same course every single time. Yeah, I mean that's you know if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. If they're making you do it, that's a different story. But if you're in college and you're playing football and you want to go get that general studies degree, you just want to take whatever courses you want. More power to you. Now, now you say that they should offer like these financial literacy courses, um, and a lot of schools have those. You know, they may not necessarily be like an actual class, but they'll offer guidance to you. Um, I mean, what's stopping these players from doing that? I mean, this. I mean, I, I would say knowledge of the class. I bet you, That's I would true. bet money it, it should, if you pull the players, they would not know about it. Right. I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but I mean, yeah. I, I, I definitely think it should have more exposure. I think that, I mean, I think not only should you tell the athletes about this, I think everyone needs to, I mean, everyone should have access to this or everyone should have uh, knowledge of these courses. But um, no, yeah, I, I, I see where you're coming from. I think this should be like a much less forced thing and a more like, hey, this is available to you. Check it out, please, sort of thing. Yeah, and I want to address it. I know... There'll be some criticism because I said thousands to millions of dollars, whatever. And if you think I'm exaggerating, there's been some projections um, that I believe Bleacher Report had. They teamed up with a financial company to do this. Here's some Sam Ellinger, based on these projections and based on what his social media following is now and all this, he would be making $962,000 a year next football season if... If if the rules the NCAA have proposed were in place, yeah, that's pretty. That's cool. a lot of money, and Jamar Chase would make around three hundred thousand a year. And th- th- this one is insane. So D- DJ um, Ugalele, the Clemson commit quarterback, number one in the country, has not even stepped on Clemson's campus yet. Would make around a hundred thousand a year before even playing a snap for Clemson. Yeah, but you don't think Clemson is going to be selling T-shirts that have like lays on them, like like on the front of the T-shirt <laughs> because of it. They are. I mean, that's just a fact. No, no. I was just I was just saying like to show like how much like power this has and how much money like uh, Sam Ellinger is not even probably a top five quarterback in the country. No, but do you and he's about many, to be making almost know, a million dollars. Do you know how many Sam Ellinger jerseys Texas sells? Oh, it probably a lot. His name on the nameplate, but it has his number. Well, on no, it. no, no, no. I'm not saying this is wrong. I was just saying this shows like the importance of why we need to like teach these teach these athletes about how to manage money. Because if you just hand a random kid almost a million dollars, I mean, uh, I, right now I am 23. If you handed me a million dollars, I would not be sure exactly what to do with it. To be completely honest, I mean. Well, I, would I make some mistakes? Absolutely. But you have to, we need to be setting these kids up for as much success as possible. And that's the whole argument about paying players, right? Is that they're being taken advantage of. We need to set them up for future, gener- like you need to have that generational wealth as like someone like LeBron would say, but how are you ever going to get there if you don't, if you don't teach people how to manage their money? Right. No, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's it. And the only thing I, like I said, I'm not going to say it again. I disagree with you slightly, but it's it's. I think we're both on the same side of this argument. Yeah, and to, to almost to wrap this up, if Sam Ellinger is making almost a million dollars a year, how much would Tua or Trevor Lawrence be making? Oh my gosh, Trevor Lawrence! It's got to. It's got to be, be over highest, two mil. He would be. Would you even consider him like a public employee? Like you know how those lists come out that are like the highest paid public officials in each state. And it's usually yeah. like a football game. I think Trevor Lawrence would be paid higher than Dabo. Yeah, he would have to, right? I don't know, man. They, they pay Dab- Dabo an outrageous amount. Well, he makes almost 10 mil a year. I don't know, man. Tre- I mean, that's Trevor a lot Lawrence of money. Be, he's going to get paid more next year. Well, unless he gets back to Clemson. He'll be, he'll be paid way more than the NFL. 
Like, no, yeah, no. Th- that's a fact. I mean, he'll be making millions if this goes through. But yeah, guys, this, I mean, for me, just to wrap this up, this is a serious issue. And these comments from Bush should, for me, ignite some, a little bit of a change in the way we prepare these athletes to manage their wealth. And for the people who got like got offended by, it, I, I just I don't think it was supposed to be like a shot at athletes or a shot saying that they shouldn't be paid. Because even in the interview, he says that like I kind of missed the boat on this. Like I was getting paid before we were supposed to. And like, this is a great thing, but we need to make sure they don't make the same mistakes I did. And I think that's a fair criticism of it. I don't think he meant anything bad by that. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. But guys, we're going to wrap up this episode. Shout out to Brandon for chilling in the McDonald's parking lot to get this episode to you guys. We felt so bad about not bringing you guys an episode that we talked last night. We said, we're getting this together. We're going to get them one episode this week. So shout out to Brandon for that guys. Um, but we definitely appreciate y'all tuning in. I think this proves it, um, you know, but subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, guys, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. Find us on YouTube, the Blue Blood CFB podcast. Subscribe there. Um, Instagram at the underscore Blue Bloods. Facebook at the Blue Bloods pod. Twitter at the underscore underscore blue bloods. Uh, shout out to everyone who follows us. We got to step up our Twitter game. We'd say this every episode. Find us on there. Do y'all's thing. Uh, rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts. We've been getting a few more ratings. Shout out to you guys on that. Um, tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your uh, workers now. We're all everyone's kind of getting out of quarantine now. So tell everybody. Um, but next week we'll be coming back at you guys with a normal schedule. We got, we got some special guests lined up. We got the, some plans for the audible coming up. We got merch plans and website plans, all that good stuff. But guys, for right now, we out.